Let me just give you a brief reasons why we are trying to do this. Uh, the Bible, if you read Bible, the history, how God's people worship from the beginning of the Bible, they usually do it together like this. Uh, from infants to the grandparents, they are all together. You look at any of the biblical uh, narratives, you will find them together listening and worshiping, bowing down together. That's how it has been. But sadly, in our culture, I'm talking about Korean churches, whether in here or in Korea, for Korean church, I've been saying this many, many times, it takes 30 years for our children to come into this worship sanctuary. They are separate from birth. They go to nursery, pre-K, K. You know, you go around all these different rooms and by the time you get here, or before you come here, you go to college. You go to college. When you come back from college during the break, where do you go? Usually there's something called EM, English Ministry. You go there, you don't find your friends. Oftentimes the pastors are not the same person. They're not the same people. So you don't know him. You don't know the people. So you just stop going to church. Or you, if you find a church where your friends are going, there you will be uh, headed to. So my heart today uh, for the month of August, I don't know why you came, especially young children. Maybe you were forced to come. Your parents asked you to come. You didn't want to come. But understand it from your parents' perspective. I am a parent. I have three kids, one in college, second going off to college, third one in elementary. So if you become a parent someday, you will understand how desperate we are to bring you and hold onto you in this faith community. So we will do anything and everything we can to bring people in. Before I came here to this church for six years, I was a minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I was their senior minister for six years. And they did something else. They did something called worship. They didn't call it covenant worship. They didn't call it family worship. They just came and sat together. So if you go to many of the conservative Baptist American Presbyterian churches, you will see families sitting together from nursery to grandparents all in the same line. Jonathan Edwards, in his history, if you read him, there was seat assigned to the families by their prominence. So each family will sit together. Is, is it a right thing? Is that the only way? No, it's not. Because I, when, as I preach to them, little kid wouldn't understand. So I even asked my fellow elder, the guy, I mean, is this right thing to do? I'm preaching, kids don't understand. So they need to hear the gospel, but I mean, it's hard to do. I cannot preach to the kids and to the adults at the same time. Uh, but he said, no, it's okay. This is how we do it. So what, do you, what about your children? They don't understand. But he said, it's okay. They are learning how to worship God. And what they do not understand, guess what? I am going to teach them in my family worship time. So you do what you do, and this is how we do it. And I don't know, there are strengths and weaknesses and, and strength in doing this and obviously weaknesses in doing this. But to me, at least for a month, this month of August, I will try this. My heart is for the seniors graduating this year, graduated this May or June. We are going to off to a college, but I want them to come into this place, this beautiful sanctuary. There's... Really, there's no place like this in America in Korean churches. I've been around. I've looked at the YouTubes. It's a beautiful sanctuary. Look at this. It's a beautiful high ceiling. Nothing like this. But they never get to sit in this place. They go around all these little rooms and 
they don't come in. So if they choose to leave this church, they have a, they had never a single chance to worship in this place with their parents or with, with, with their friends and families. So I have about three targets for a month of August. That is, first of all, it is graduate, they're graduating seniors or going to freshmen, going into freshmen in college. That's first group. Second group that you could reach out to are the people who grew up in this church, but they are searching for churches around the town. I know where they are going, but not everybody has settled down. That I know too. They've tried, they've followed their friends, but many of them, they're not going to church. So you ask them to come. The third group are the people that there's a strange phenomenon in, in L.A. A couple of weeks ago, I uh, one of my friends came from West Coast. He's serving at a big Korean mega church on the West Coast. And he told me something very interesting, and uh, it's something worth hearing. His church is competing against a couple of churches, American churches. One is Saddleback Church. The other is um, Marina's Church. Marina's Church, they have Disneyland, literally Disneyland in the church. They have train tracks, all these little pockets of fun places. Why? To draw people to church. Settle back to You know those prominent churches. So his church is Korean American church, but it's huge. But they are competing against these two mainline American churches. And he told me he has about 120 couples, international couples. Mostly one spouse is Korean or well, Korean American. The other spouse, whatever. So they go. They go to different churches. Um, but he told me most of them, they cannot settle down in those big churches. And they come back. Sadly, they were not welcomed. And I cannot find out every single reason, but that's the case. So they come back. They come back with their American spouse, but they don't want to go into the English ministry. Why is that? Because English ministry is usually younger but not anymore, but usually younger. But for American, usually our EM ministry is very Korean-American culture. It's second-gen Korean-American culture. So they don't, fit, they don't fit in well. But they come to Korean church for the sake of their spouses, husbands or wives. So they, they would love to worship together with their spouses. So they come to main sanctuary and they put the translator on. He told me. So 120 couples he has. So times two, that's couple. And with kids, that's a few hundreds. And he's overseeing them. So he was asking me, saying, Sam, why don't, why don't you some, do something for your, for your church? Why don't you try? You don't have to do set it up, translation going on here and there. You don't have to do none of that. You don't have to be stressed out. Just preach in Konglish, that's what he said, Konglish. So I said, okay, that, that sounds right. And I have a s daughter who just graduated, who's going to college. And I feel like I have just a few Sundays to influence her. Seniors, they don't want to come here. They think this is an adult, strict conservative, boring, Presbyterian worship. That may be true. But I want all of you to know this is something that we are trying for the sake of the gospel and for the next generation. And I hope you come. I hope you come for the next few Sundays. And don't make it like last Friday. <laughs> if you were here last Friday, nobody was there. Just my family, Bumoksanim's family, another family, but Cheongyeonbu came. So thank you, Cheongyeonbu. Cheongyeonbu들도요 다 이세와 가까워요. 다 영어해요. 우리 할머니 할아버지 in the 90s, they may not speak English, but most people, if you are making money and make a living in America, you speak English. Don't tell me you don't speak English. I've gone around visiting people's shops. They all speak. English. Trust me. So, we'll try. 
Um, and I want you to hear uh, God's word for the next few weeks. I hope it will be helpful. But before I go on, for, 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 for you American friends, let me get that out of the way. When I usually preach, Americans usually approach me after service and they ask me, I cannot locate your accent. Always. And I tell you, someone told me my accent is black Asian Southern accent. I have it all. Francis Chang told me, a very famous guy, Francis Chang told me, Sam, you have Southern black Asian accent. I said, what is that? I didn't have any black friends in, in high school. It was a dorm. I had Africans, but not black people. And in my church, and in my dorm, Southern, yes, I have that draw, people say. It's okay. Asian, I don't know, but I don't care. I really don't care. When I was younger, I was conscious of those things. I, at, at, at my age, I just do not care. All I want to do is to bring in the gospel to everyone. I don't care who they are. You're 60 years old, 90 years old, American, white, black, Asian. I don't care. I'm here to preach the gospel. But today, my focus is on senior going into college. So if you are older, you could sit back and relax. But I cannot preach to all these different generations. All of your needs are different. I don't know what you're thinking about, what your needs are. Uh, but I thought about something, so I got a feedback from my daughter. So what do you want to hear from me? She said, nothing. <laughs> so, I, so I said, okay. But tell me something. Give me something. I need to, I need to, I need to speak on something. I said, um, can you talk about evolution? Uh, something gay marriage, something, something exciting, not forgiveness, not loving each other. So I said, okay. And I thought about it. Do you know anything about evolution? I don't. <laughs> I know it's wrong, but I don't know. I went to college, believe it or not. I went to, and I went to study uh, chemistry. Uh, but that whole evolution. So what I decided to do is to give you a overview. So primarily I'm speaking to those people who are going into college. So that level, intellectual level, spiritual level, whatever level, but I hope that you could learn something else too. Um, when I went to seminary here, somewhere here, Professors, been, they've been saying few words cluster together. And time passed, 10, 20 years later, when I look back my time in that seminary, those few words were stuck in me, and it gave me a lens through which you are seeing the world. 세계관이라 그래요. It's so a worldview. It's called worldview. So most of the kids, they come to Sunday worship. They listen to a sermon. But sermon deals with a particular topic, right? Correct? So whatever you preach on today, earlier in youth group, you've heard your preacher or pastor speaking on a topic. We cannot talk about every single topic. But you hear a sermon. Let's say forgiveness. Next week you come and you hear about Jesus' parable. Next week you talk about something else. What that does is that you have all these multiple ideas about Christianity, but it's not tied together, so it does not make sense. You understand what I'm saying? You have this, this topical understanding of the church and Christianity, but it has not formed a worldview for you to live your own life. So my college kids, the, the uh, kids that are growing, going to college, you will be in a couple of weeks. Most of you will be off in a couple of weeks to go to college, dormitory, setting up a dorm, all that fun stuff. But you'll be on your own. Nobody is going to be there to help you, push you, to go to church and do this thing and that. You're alone. You, are, you, you will enjoy your freedom. Do that. But what I wanted 
you to have before you go off to college is to have a, a worldview. Not simply, Jesus did this. Jesus healed this person. This is that teaching. What is the fundamental worldview, Christian worldview? That's something that you could hold on to. Something that I actually, without really knowing, held on to past 20-some years of my ministry in New York and now in Pennsylvania is this, that the words that you see on the bulletin, the four simple words that that summarize the entire Bible, which I will uh, call, this is a Christian worldview. 이게 그리스도인의 세계관이에요. 네 단어가. So if you look at it, it starts with creation, and then fall, and then redemption. What's the last word? This is a bit hard. This last word is consummation. So when I was in seminary, this is, this is the, this, these are the words that I will always hear from our professors. Whenever they start speaking on something, they say, well, there is creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. Many professors, they started speaking in that fashion, right? In Westminster Seminary, that's what they do. They talk about these four words, and I didn't really pay attention to that. But later on, when I see a world event, I will remember those four words, and it gives me certain category through which I see the world and interpret it, and also have some kind of hope in my life. So if you're off to college, like my daughter, I want you to remember these four words. So today, in the remainder of our time, I want to just briefly talk about these four sections briefly. When you're off to college, I went to, I went to college in Texas. I grew up in Texas. I didn't grow up in Texas. I went to Texas when I, when I was 17. I didn't grow up in there. I went to Texas. But my UT, my school at the time, Austin, had 50,000 people. Most populous universities is one of the most populous universities in the United States at the time, and at Ohio State. 50,000 people mixing together and all these people. I mean, it was just so big. It was so hot. It was so big. All I remember from Texas, it was hot and big. From campus from here today, it takes about 30 minutes to walk in the blazing sun. But 50,000 people mixing together, and when you go off to college, you are rooming with someone that you don't know. I roomed with, in high school, a couple different groups of people. They put me with Americans, like real Americans. They wanted me to learn English, so they put me in to that. But next year, I was put in with Guatemalan, Ghana from Africa, Ghana, China, Taiwan, Brazil. All these people were mixing together in my high school year. This is the this early 90s. No internet. I remember first time hearing Spanish. The guy was from Mexico. He was on the phone. I stopped. I didn't know what that language was. I was 17 years old. It was Spanish. I still remember his name, but I'm not going to say his name because you may find it on the YouTube. He was speaking the language that I, I, I just, I never heard that language. Spanish. So you are mixing together with all these people, but they will all have their own worldview. So you will have some trouble with the people who did not grow up with you or like you in your city, home state, or different countries. I mean, it was a chaos. And in, in, in my dorm in high school, all these kids in the 90s, and not everybody was smart back then. Everybody was a little bit, we didn't know. So when you mix these teenagers together and live together, guys, live together, I'm telling you, murder. <laughs> so almost every day, I'm telling you, I just try to survive every day. College is like that too. You will see all kinds of people advocating all different ideas. Why? Because they believe in different things. But this would be something that should be um, reminding you who you are as a Christian. If I ask you, who are you? And I'm a Christian, I'm a forgiven person, I go to heaven, all that is great. But you've got to have a worldview. 
And no better way to summarize Christian worldview than these four words. So let's look at it one by one quickly. But first one is creation. So today's verse from Genesis 1.1. Everybody knows this. Can we read it together? 시작. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right. There are a bunch of passages coming, but you will see it on the screen. But I simply wanted us to start with the very first verse of the Bible. Bible begins with God, and as you have, said, as you have read, there is no attempt by the Bible to prove God's existence. Just in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's how it begins. The Bible began, and everything for you, Christian, it starts with God. That's our position. God the Creator created all things is the beginning point of all things for Christians. That's where we begin. God the creator. God is the great starting point. God introduces himself, explains himself in this way in Exodus. Moses, that famous prince of Egypt, he asks this question, who are you? What's your name? You are sending me back to your people, but I need to know your name. So what's your name? And Exodus 3.14 it says this, God tells Moses, this is his name. In English, it is explained, I am that which I am, or I am who I am, or more accurately, I am becoming that which I am becoming. But you don't want to speak God becoming something. That's why they just said with that, I am who I am, and the theologians will say that name explains the attribute of God is what? Self-existence. God is self-existing being. That's our God. If I ask you today, right now, take out a paper, a piece of paper, write down or define God, what would you say? 종이에다가 신이 하나님이 무엇이냐고 써보세요 하면 뭐라고 쓰시겠습니까? Most people, I imagine, would say, God, um, God is there. Can I see? I hope he's good. Something like that. Nobody could fill up on half a page defining God. But our God, the very starting point for all of us, existence, the world, everything else, is God. And a document written in 1647, about 500 years ago, 1647 in Westminster in, in England, Westminster Abbey. They defined, the pastors defined God of the Bible in this way. He said that in there. If it, it is way too long for me to just read Westminster Confession 2.2. Of sale? We'll skip. It's way too long for me to read. This God who created all things, think about it. If God is good and holy, everything that he made must have been good and holy. He cannot create something evil with imperfection. He cannot do that. He's a, a complete God. Because God is good and holy, all that he has made in the beginning was good and holy. So if you remember Genesis chapter 1, he remarks every time he creates something, it was good. It was good. It was good. Obvious because, it's obviously because God is good. But now here, let me ask you, let me give you a snapshot, evolution. For those of you who are going off to college, I want you to hear this section very, very clearly. This is very important. Going into college, and if you do anything science, you will major in biology, and it will basically it will be default position. Even in 
High school too. Oh, it's too late. Too late. So, um, you go in, and I studied chemistry. I didn't take biology. I had to take physics. Hated physics. But biology, you have to study, and it is basically the assumption is all that you know. Evolution, evolution, evolution. Um, I don't know everything there is to know about evolution. That's okay. You don't have to pretend to know. And I've studied here and there, read books on um, creationism versus revolution. And this is one thing I've noticed. As soon as I speak on what I've studied to the people, English-speaking people, about evolution, you know what they do? I've read and I've studied and I'm presenting my case from young to old. When I talk about this, guess what they do? They fall asleep. 아무리 제가 이 진화론과 창조론을 공부하고 해도요, 막상 설교를 하면 다 자요. Not everyone is able to follow the arguments, and they. What I found out is they care, but they don't care. Isn't that true? Have you actually picked up books and listened to the lectures and fought with these people? No. We know they are wrong with them, but we just go along and we just keep it quiet, and we we just don't know. We don't we don't spend our time. So today, what I want to do is I'm not going to talk about evolution per se. Because really, don't, people don't care. But if you are a student, incoming freshman, I want you to remember these at least. You don't have to be on the defensive as a Christian on this issue. But you could be an offensive guy, person, in asking these questions. Two questions. That I've heard and stuck with me for past 20 years studying theology, writing a bunch of stuff. As a Bible believing Christian, some of the couple of questions that I could ask to a non believing friends or even sophisticated people, professor, whatever. Two questions, the mighty questions that you could ask to dismantle their own worldview by being an offense. On the, on the offensive rather than defensive side is this question that I want you to remember. You ask them, whoever challenges your worldview as a creationist, we believe in the beginning God created all things, period. But that sounds uh, too religious. It doesn't sound smart. It doesn't sound intellectual. It sounds fanatical even. But you ask these questions to those sophisticated, smart, intelligent people. Why is there something rather than nothing? That's the first question. You ask them, why is, that, why is it that there is something rather than nothing? That's kind of a philosophical question, too. But common sense, why is there something rather than nothing? And you ask this follow-up second question to them. Can something come out of nothing? You ponder upon those two questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something? Why is there a world? Why is there a universe? Why is there sun, moon, and stars? All of that. Why is it? Why? As opposed to nothingness, why is there something? Why universe? You ask them. And the follow-up question is the killer question. Can something come out of nothing? Now, if you ask those questions, they, they will give you two answers. Well, I don't know, but most people will default back to Big Bang. They, that's 99% of the time you will hear there's a Big Bang. Then you ask the same question again. Where or how did that happen? 
when there's nothing, absolutely nothing in the entire existence. There was nothing, just not even blankness, just complete nothingness. How can the universe come out of nothingness is that question. I'm telling you, nobody could answer that question. It assumes all the evolutionary theory is wrong. And let me just quote you one of the best spoken, outspoken, anti-religion, anti-Christianity biologist from Oxford. He, well, he, he retired. His name is Richard Dawkins. I'm probably you have heard Richard Dawkins. About 10 years ago, he wrote a book, God Delusion. He was saying, all of you theists, doesn't matter, Islam, Christianity, whatever, whoever you believe in, some type of God, you are delusional. That's how he was mocking theists. We are theists too, because we believe in God who created all things. But in his book, God Delusional, when you look at it, you find out he is a pseudo-scientist. I looked it up. How did he become an Oxford professor? What did he write his paper on? 1970s, he wrote a paper on a bee, Asian bee in Oxford to get his PhD, and he's a, he's a so-called so evolutionary biologist. Well, he's a popular speaker, but when you look at his work, it is a pseudoscience. There's no science but his theory. So don't be fooled, people. You go to college, there is a biology prof professor in that big name school. You bow down. Obviously, you have learned things from him or her, but not everybody knows what they're talking about is also my point. And you ask them, when you think about it, how can something come out of nothing? And they, he, Dawkins, says, well, there is only two answers to that, either God or chance. Guess what he chooses? Chance. So when you ex learn, uh, hear his ex explanation of chance, because he hates God, any idea of God, he thinks it's backward, it's bad, it's not good. So okay, so chance. You know what he says in his book? I was going to bring his book and read it, an excerpt from the book. He says, well, it takes... Billions of galaxies and billions of years too for one condition to be met in a bacterial formation. That's what he said. Billions of galaxies and billions of years of evolutionary process to take over and whatever hydrogen and oxygen, whenever that, however it met, becomes human. So his assumption is billions. As I was reading it, I remember thinking, this sounds pretty dumb. Well, billions of galaxies and billions of years, only because you have this Oxford title, doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. You wrote your paper on bees. You're telling me the universe, how it began. You wrote on papers on bees, and you, you understand how it came to be? No. They are banking on this chance. So you've got to ask the thing. You've got to ask the follow question. What is chance? What is chance? Ask them question, this question. What is chance? Chance is no thing. No, there's no such thing as chance. Chance cannot create materials, non-existent materials out of nothing, and then somehow it becomes human. So that's my rudimentary understanding of evolution and creationism, although there are a bunch of things that I could talk about, but I'm an amateur. But also scientists, they don't know how it began. So you ask those questions, and they will have a hard time answering you, and they will get mad at you, but they will not be able to answer. It's either self-creation of creation or, well, I don't know, but for us, our God, who is that which I am, I am who I am, that self-existing, eternal being, we don't know, we cannot explain that such a being. But he is presented to us. Yes, it is by faith we believe it, but that's how our worldview begins. Second worldview is the fall. 
creation. Next thing that you find in the Bible is fall. You have to this, tie these four pearls together, make a necklace to a, hang on your neck. This is, this, is, this is your worldview of creation. We believe in that God. No chance, no evolution. No such a being have power, has power to create things other than God. This sophisticated, all this nerve system, eyes, brain. Are you kidding me? Dawkins is saying billions of, oh, billions of years. Nonsense. The second worldview is the fall. But what I want to focus a couple of things. When you hear the fall, what, do you, what comes to your mind? Fall. Fall tells us people are wicked. People do sinful things. So we say, well, fall entails sinful behavior. But I want to add a um, couple of things. Fall also includes intellectual side. We call that spiritual blindness, but the fall also affected your faculty or people's faculty in thinking about searching for God because our hearts are darkened. So I want you to remember this. The fallen people that you see in the world will think that way, and because of their thinking, their behavior is such. You understand? So it's the mind, their mind telling them what to do, and their mind, the intellectual process, even. Yes, they could think logically, they could teach us calculus, they could teach us all kinds of stuff. But there is also intellectual side of the fall that you need to understand, that theologians talk about it as the noetic effect of sin. Sin effect had an effect upon your knowledge too. Just a couple of verses. Yes, it's Christian argument, but Romans 1, 20, 21, Romans 1, 1장 20절, 1장 21절 보여주시면 Somebody, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen. Where? In the creation. Being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they know God, who, 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 who are we talking about? People know God. What do you mean? They are atheists. Well, they know there is God. That's what they are arguing. The Bible is arguing. They did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Did you hear the last part? They became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. So the mind is darkened or messed up. So their ability to think about God is impaired. They would not think about God. So the ep epitome of all that is atheism in Psalm 14.1. says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So that's the end result of it. Do we have next verses? Fall had an effect not only on behavior, but on their minds. It's darkened. So guess what they're going to do? What their darkened minds will tell them they will do. So the sinful behavior. So you cannot fix people up. Only thing that politics will be able to do is to fix up people with their behavior. But we are after the heart, the mind, renewed mind. But that fallen mind manifests itself with the sensuality. So Romans 1.24 and following says, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. And guess what they do? For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. 126. For this reason, God gave them, who are them? Whose hearts are darkened, gave them over to dishonorable passions. We talk about sexual passions. For their females exchanged the natural function of that for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the males abandoned. The natural function of the female, which we're talking about sexual function here, and 
burned in their desire toward one another. We are talking about homosexuality. Males with males committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. You see, so according to the Bible, the fallen mind does not simply stay within the mind. It comes out, but it comes out as lusts. And what do you see in this day and age? Well, I see, in my, back in the days, gay marriage was a big deal. But it all began to change in the 90s. When? I don't know if you remember some of the older people. The shows, TV shows, the Ellen show. I don't know if you remember Will and Grace. Now the modern family. All of that, those shows are changing the perception. The world that is now in 2024 in America is not the same in the 1990s even. You go back 30 years back, it was not like this. But the perception changed because of the mass media influence. And now, when you walk into a college, it's a suicide to talk about God. Your career, your future. It's a very difficult situation. How can you, as a believer of the Bible, stand up for the truth and yet get a next internship with an evolutionary biologist? How can you work in a journalism advocating for heterosexual worldview when you do not sign up with the LGBTQ I mean the world has already silenced Christians but it comes out you gotta understand they may be after you think some lofty ideas the freedom of sexuality transgenderism LGBTQ plus, whatever the plus, you look it up, that changes all the time. It, they add. People, they do not admit, but their fallen mind is telling them to enjoy the world. And it comes out with sexual lust. So it's not simply idea fight, understand? It's not simply Bible versus the world. It's not simply versus... Happy family versus modern family. Traditionalism versus modernism. It's not that. The, way, the reason why they argue for all of that, the big chunk of it is because they own lusts. So they want to advocate what they want to do and enjoy. But the Bible is a very difficult and uncomfortable truth. We are telling them, you're wrong. You're telling them, well, there is God who is going to hold you accountable for all that you do. Oh, they don't want to hear. But guess what? Romans chapter 1 that we just read from was written 2,000 years ago in Rome, or for, for Rome, Roman church. So even at the time, the Roman Empire was filled with this filthy stuff. Men and men, women and women, unnatural, all of the language, but the power of the gospel overturned the entire empire. 8325. Mm. And then all that changed because of the gospel. Now, third, third is redemption. So, creation, fall, had all the effect on not simply your sinful behavior, but your mind. And that mind is hostile toward God. And it also manifests itself in an unholy way. So I want you to remember as you're going to college, the third is redemption. But when we talk about redemption, salvation, what do we have in mind? Usually we have in mind salvation after death. We go to heaven. Well, that's good. That's great. But I want to add a couple of more perspective on that. Redemption is bodily, with body, bodily, the whole person, is communal with the church, and it, it is cosmic. See, it's not simply this. I believe in Jesus, and my sins are forgiven, I go to heaven. That's great. That's the essence of the gospel. 
but you have to have better and bigger theology as you go into college. That your salvation that is in Christ Jesus obviously, naturally includes your salvation of your soul. But God has redeemed you with a body. Your redemption is to be lived out in the community with other believers. And it also going toward the cosmic. So a couple of verses. First Peter is about soul salvation. First Peter 1 8, 1 9, 1 9. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. But I don't know how many of you know your redemption also includes the body. Our youth pastors, you gotta emphasize this, right? It's not simply your soul going to heaven, but later on dead will be raised. And you'll be united with the resurrected body, which is not, not dishonorable, but honorable body. And you will live your eternal life, not simply with your brain floating around, soul somehow floating around, but with your resurrected body. So as Christians, we have to take care of our body. And I'm not talking about body as not drinking soda body. Take care of your body. But body to keep you from sinful acts that is done upon your body. So the Bible says, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Did you know? Do you know? 우리 몸이 하나님의 성전으로 우리의 구원은 영혼만의 구원이 아니라 몸의 구원도 포함함을 믿으시기를 바랍니다. 우리 특별히 대학생들은 대학에 갈 때, 몸을 가지고 갈 때에 너무나 많은 유혹들이 있습니다. But you have to understand whom you have from God and that you are not on your own, not your own. For you have been bought with a price. What was the price? Blood of Christ, pretty high price. Therefore glorify God. What does it say? Last few words. In your body. And the context of 1 Corinthians 6 is about sexual immorality. Many Christians, they condemn homosexuality, but they fall into the trap of sexual sins. You could argue against LGBTQ all you want. But your life, if you, especially in college, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, young ones now, you're going off to college. Cohabitation is sin. I want you to hear from it, hear from the Bible. Cohabitation, sex is only, only allowed in the marital commitment. Self-sacrificing commitment that you have before God and men. And within, only within that context that is allowed. Premarital, extramarital. And cohabitation that I see all the time. College students living together, rooming together, roommates with opposite sex, all of that you simply cannot do. That is sin. I want you to know. So take care of your body. So redemption is not simply I'm going to heaven. So I could do whatever I want with my body. Well, the Bible says, includes your body, temple, communal. It's about church too. 2 Timothy 2.22. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace by yourself. With those who call on the name, call upon the Lord from a pure heart. You cannot survive this fight on your own. So you need to belong to a church. This is also salvation is cosmic. The world, the creation itself will be renewed at the end. Romans 8, 19 through 21. Last section. So what does this have to do with my worldview? This is how it worked for me. 2020, when the whole world was shut down, and I heard it was particularly bad in Philadelphia with riots going on everywhere. I mean, I, I was just a bad time. 
People have different perspectives whether to participate in the march and pray. Should we do this? Should we cover up? Should we get a shot or not? It was a massive, massive fight in our community. I had a, many, many people who thought covering up the mass was unbiblical, believe it or not. Getting a shot, people say, was unbiblical. How are we going to then worship together? It was a horrible, horrible time. within the body of Christ. But when you look at the world, when the world is burning, your moms and your pops, their stores are burning. And I've heard from a guy, my friend who was serving in the church next door, whose deacon had a store in Philly somewhere. It was burning, but he was watching it burn through the drop cam, you know, the nest cam. Cops will not come Their million-dollar stores, the, the inventory was there. They were burning. I don't know. I don't know. During those times, what, what are we supposed to do? Just by, by believing in I'm going to heaven doesn't help you. I'm telling you. But when you have this creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, this whole full track in your worldview, you look at a world that is burning and say, well, that's what you expect. from this fallen world. Unexplainable, unimaginable acts of crime. You say, what's, what's wrong with this world? What's wrong with these people? Well, you expect that to happen in the world, in the fallen world. So you are not surprised. And you say, well, those movements, all of that, well, it's good and well, but that's not the ultimate solution because we know after the fall, you need redemption in Christ. So you have that kind of hope. And you look at the world, the world is not getting better. I'm telling you, I was here since 1994. It's getting worse. Only thing getting better is communication and the phone. But you have this consummation. What's consummation? Usually we talk about it as a second coming of Christ. When Christ comes back, it's over. That's it. Game over. He's going to conquer. He's going to reward. But that passage I want you to read. What's the renewal at the end? Cosmic redemption is new heavens and new earth. Revelation 21. This is how it ends. This is the end. What's going to happen at the end? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, that's right now had passed away and there was no more sea no longer any sea i saw the holy city new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for husband and all the rest now i'm going to summarize today well first of all i want to say thank you thank you for coming i'm encouraged to see many of you families, especially parents, I want to thank you for making an effort. I know it was a hard, hard thing to do. Even me, my daughter was like, why? <laughs> why? I don't want to go. My friends are not coming. And they didn't come, but that's okay. Thank you for coming. I don't know what the future holds for this, at least for this kind of a type of worship. I, I really don't know. But I want to th say thank you to the children too. Uh, thank you for coming, youth group. It's for your own good, but I want to thank you anyway. You should thank me, but you should thank yourself too. 한국말을 영어를 못 알아들으시면서 앉아 계신 분들 감사합니다. 어떤 분들은 일부 예배 때, 이부 예배 때 오셨어요. 근데 제가 한마디라도 더 우리 영어권 자녀들에게 해주고 싶어서 오늘 좀 영어를 많이 썼습니다. 이해해 주셔서 감사하고요. Let us remember these four words. This is how the world is and will be. There was creation. There was fall. And there was redemption already in Christ. And there will be consummation. The end. That's my world view. Is that your worldview? If it is, you will do well. 
you'll survive. Let's pray.